Welcome back to our workshop. My name is Scott Bennett. I'm the owner of Wouldn't It Be Nice Furniture Repair. When I'm working on newer furniture, it's very different than working on furniture restoration. When I restore furniture from the mid-century modern era or earlier, it's got different wood, different finishes, and different joinery techniques than newer furniture. I've got a box from an online retailer here that has furniture that hasn't been assembled yet that has a problem that I need to fix. I'm going to show you how I diagnose these issues and fix these issues so you can understand how to repair this type of furniture. I'm also going to share with you some advice on how to purchase furniture that will last for decades to come. As a furniture repair business, we're opening the doors to our workshop to show you the tools and techniques to repair furniture. The front rail here, you can see this has been broken off. We give you tips to make your repair projects easier. Let's get into the workshop and start fixing furniture. I'm going to start with this chair here. I need to price it out for the customer, but I can't tell what's going on, so I need to investigate. The problem with this chair is it looks fine, but look how loose this leg is. There's something going wrong on the inside. There are three hints in this chair that tell me there's something wrong. One is the loose leg. The second is there's a crack up here at the top, and it looks like this leg may have been repaired before. The third clue is this chair is extremely light. It almost feels like it's made of cardboard and balsa wood. So I'm going to flip it over. We'll take a look at what's going on on the inside. We'll just get some padding down here and we'll take a look at the chair. So you can see here, this is made by Urban Barn. And let's see, where is it made? Made in China. This is the wobbly leg here. You can just see how loose that is. So I'll just take a tack lifter here and get it. Oh, this is pretty loose. Maybe someone's taken this apart already. Oh, that's suspiciously loose. These three staples that are here are from a traditional staple gun. These are not upholstery staples. This one's upholstery staple. The same over here. These three are not upholstery staples. Neither is that one, but the ones over here are. So there's also a crack here. This has definitely been repaired by someone before. So let's unravel this mystery and see what's going on here. Well, these staples are not even in here. Oh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> someone's handiwork here. Someone's put a screw in this leg and you can't put metal in joinery like this because it just doesn't hold. Look how loose this is. This is crazy. Here I can see some replacement staples as well so someone's pulled back the fabric. So let's keep digging. I'm learning one thing about this chair. This wood is very soft. Which doesn't surprise me. Light wood is typically soft wood. But these staples, I shouldn't be able to just lift out like this. Typically need to use a mallet to get in there and loosen them up. I'll turn this around here and we'll see if we can pull the fabric off the front. Okay, and oh, there's another screw. Yep, definitely been repaired before. Oh, and look at the split in the wood here. So someone has glued this together. You can see a screw protruding here. Yeah, this is not going to be an easy fix. So in here, there's a tenon that goes from this part of the leg through to this part here. And I can see that's been broken off. I'm going to take these screws out and see what happens here. Wow, that was long. And you can see it's bent as well. So on this side here, you can see this is where, this is called a mortise. And there's wood that's been split here. This has been re-glued back in, but not glued in the right spot. There's also a crack across here. So the grain on this piece is running across this way. And that's causing weakness in this joint. On this side, it looks like the tenon stayed in, but it's broken off. So over here, you can see this is a tenon sticking out here, and that's what goes inside the mortise. That's what holds these two pieces together. On this side, we're actually missing a tenon, and that's the one that's broken inside here. So to fix this, I have to put a new tenon in here. it would be called a floating tenon. And to fix the leg, this leg can't be repaired. It's got to be replaced. The work to replace this leg is creating mortises in the leg. Then it's tapering the leg because it's smaller at the bottom than it is at the top. 
and then matching the finish on the new leg so it matches the other legs. On the broken tenon here, I need to cut a mortise in here, which is very difficult to do while it's still intact. So I'll need to pull back the upholstery, take this piece off, do that work, and then assemble this back together again. The work in this is likely more costly than the chair is originally. Now when I give a customer a quote like this, I can never predict which way it's going to go. Sometimes people have more chairs and they want this one to match them so they'll invest. In other cases, it's not a big deal for them and they'll end up throwing it out. So unfortunately, a piece of furniture like this is going to the landfill. But why did this chair break? The grain in this leg is on an angle. And when you're making legs, it has to be dead straight wood. That way that the joint is going to be as strong as possible. So this was not a well-made chair. Um, even if I fix this, there's no guarantee that that leg might not give way as well. So I'll talk to the customer, find out what they'd like to do, and I'll come back and give you an update. I'll now move on to this project in the box. So this is a chair that was shipped from an online retailer to the customer. There were two chairs in here and it was shipped with parts that were missing. They contacted the retailer and the retailer couldn't get the parts. So they asked me to make up the parts. I needed to make stretchers, so three for each chair. I made the stretchers up and made sure that the finish matched and I put the first chair together. But when I put the second chair together, it wouldn't work. Why? Well, here they have the legs labeled right and left. But when I take them out of the package, you can see here this is the top where the legs get bolted in. If we go down here, you can see the mortises are the same here, and I rotate them this way, they're the same here. So what this tells me is I've got two of the same leg. So unfortunately I had to go to the customer and tell them in order for this chair to work, I need to make a new chair leg. They decided to go ahead with the work, so that's what my project here is, to build a new leg. Now, the woodworking in this isn't terribly difficult for someone who builds furniture. The challenging part is getting a finish to match, and I've had some help getting the finish to match on these pieces, and I'll show you how that's done once I build the leg.
With the new leg belt, I can move on to the finishing step, but before I do that, I just need to double check that everything fits properly before I start the finishing process. I'll take this out of the box and get it set up. On chairs that come in a box, you need to bolt them together. And this hardware is metal that's stronger, obviously, than wood, and that wear over time can cause some issues. I'll talk a little bit later in the video about what to shop for. Uh, this joinery method really isn't the best. The hardware for the assembly here just have washers and bolts, and that's one mistake here. These chairs will become loose. So I'm going to insert some lock washers there that'll help keep the joints tight. It's a common mistake. If you've got loose chairs, you need lock washers. Another odd thing about this chair is the back legs are a different color than the front legs. It's almost like they were made in two different factories. I matched the stretchers to the front legs, so that's the color I'm going to be using on the new leg. So these legs go in the corner here. They just shove in, and then they get bolted from underneath. Now I can stand this up and test the stretchers. Yep, that's a good fit. On this side down here, there's a gap in the stretcher, so I'll need to trim the stretcher, but the leg is in good shape. Now I've confirmed I've got a working chair. So to finish this leg, what I want to do is match it to this one. And it's virtually impossible to get these colors exact. So what I'm going to do is strip the finish off of this, and that way the color here, the texture here, will be exactly the same on these two front legs. This is the new leg, this is the leg I just cleaned off, and you can see how light both of these pieces of wood are. This is the original finish. So the finish that goes on these, you can't use stain to get that darkness, you literally got to use a film coat. And you can see there's a little bit of primer here. I need to prime both of these to make sure the paint will stick to it. I've gone to a local paint supplier, match the paint color, and I've got a cabinet grade paint here that will give me a nice quality finish that will be durable. Now one thing about finishes like this, when you're purchasing furniture, you see there's a knot right here. That knot is a defect and it can affect the strength of furniture. I've got a number of pieces I've repaired where knots have literally shattered a piece of furniture. So that's one thing about buying dark furniture is you don't really know what you're getting because it's covered up. If you can see the grain of the wood, you know what you're getting. The primer's dried on these, and you might wonder why I'm painting these white just to paint them dark. Bare wood won't hold paint well, so you need a primer that will bond to the wood, and then the paint can bond to the primer. Now, I've got the paint ready here, but I've also heard back from the customer on the first chair that I showed you, so she would like to proceed with it. And the reason why is she's got two other chairs that match this, so if this one doesn't work, then she's out of chair. So it's going to be a bit more of a challenge working on this chair leg 
because of the detail in it and the color. If I move this in a light, you can see that there is some texture to the wood. So this isn't a perfectly smooth factory finish. This is one that's been made to look like aged wood. And if we take a close look at it, you can see that it's also stained wood. I can see a little bit of the grain through it. When I make the replacement leg for this, I have to put that texture in. I think I've got a technique that'll work for it. It'll take some experimentation. And part of the reason I'm making this video is because this type of furniture finish isn't found in older furniture. This is new furniture finishing techniques, so I want to share with you some of the techniques you can use if you've got a piece like this to repair. I have to sand down the primer here, and then I can get to the paint. I used a shellac based primer here, and it comes out just a little bit rough. So just a slight scuff with sandpaper, and you get a chalky dust on it. That's perfect. That's exactly what you want in a primer. Something that knocks down very easily and gives you a smooth surface. The paint I'm using here is a urethane enamel, and that means it's going to be very durable, typically used for kitchen cabinets. And you can see the color looks a little bit purple. It doesn't look dark like a piece of wood furniture, but it's amazing what will happen once this dries. I relied on the paint supplier to match the dried color of the paint, so this gets me as close as I possibly can. And what I'm doing is using a mohair applicator. This will give me as close to a factory finish as possible. And I just transfer this over to my paint tray. Don't really need that much paint. So I'll just do this a couple of times. It just saves time on having to clean up the inside lip of a paint can so I can reseal it properly. Before I start painting, I'll just show you on this end, I've got a nail and that allows me to rotate this and I can get paint on all four sides. And on the top end of the leg, this part gets inserted into the upholstery. So I don't need to be concerned about the finish. I can just rotate it like this. I just need to roll off the excess paint on the roller tray here. And then we can start painting. So this will take three coats of paint to go through. So I just need to patiently go through, not overload the paint. Just enough to get a rich color on there and make it look like the rest of the chair. With the first coat dry, you can see it's looking a little purplish here. This is where two more coats are needed. This is my homemade paint tray. It's really just a box on a bit of an angle. And I just line it with tin foil, and that way I can take the tin foil out when I get rid of the paint. And one more time saver tip for you. If you wrap up your roller in a plastic bag and just keep it from getting air to it, then you can reuse it within the next few hours. So I'm just waiting four hours between coats on this. I think I need about two dips of paint in the tray here, and that's enough to cover these legs. Before the third and final coat, I just got some 400 grit sandpaper here. So I'll just knock down any of the little nibs that are on here and we'll be ready to go. This paint's now dried, but it's important to be patient here. I want it to cure and come to a full hardness. I don't want to risk damaging it right now. So I'm going to let it sit for at least a day. In the meantime, I'll pull up the next chair. I wanted to take this board out so I could put a mortise in the end for a mortise and tenon joint. But you can see here, there's a thin piece of wood that covers all this. And this is actually a very strong joint here. So I don't want to take that apart. I'm gonna to have to change my approach on the end over here and use dowels instead. When I look at the end here, I see that there's also a split happening here. 
So I need to glue all that back together again and make this solid. So while I glue that up, what I'll do is make the leg for this and get it prepared so I can work on the joiner right here. Now a split like this might be really intimidating to try and fix, but as long as it glows back together again, you can glue that together because you've got long grain. The trick is to use a blunt tip syringe. This is an 18 gauge syringe. And because I've got so much length here, what I can do is pull this open and inject glue and fill up that void. So we'll get right down deep in there, work my way around at the base, and get the glue in and work my way all the way up. And what I'll do is make sure I've got full glue coverage on that brake. And when this glue dries, it's actually going to be stronger than the rest of the wood fibers. So with the glue loaded up in there, if I squeeze this, you can see that glue squeeze out happen. So I know I've got a fully loaded joint. I just need to clamp that up in a couple spots and we're good to go. Now that I've tapered the leg, it's pretty dusty work, but what I'll do is plant it down smooth, and then I can determine what the length is here, and then cut the joinery. Some viewers have asked where I learned my skills for furniture repair and restoration. It's a long story, so I'll share a little bit of it here. I started a part-time woodworking business called Wouldn't It Be Nice back in 1999. My goal there was to build a reputation where I could charge customers a reasonable rate for custom woodworking, but also to stretch the boundaries of my skills. At that point, I was good at machine woodworking, but I've learned hand tool woodworking since then, something that these different projects have pushed me to build. And I'm really proud to have a unique tool in my workshop. It's my great grandfather's hand plane. It's a proud piece in my tool cabinet, and it's the logo for our Fixing Furniture YouTube channel. When I built furniture for customers, I would outsource the finishing process to a professional finisher. We built a great relationship, and eventually he asked me to reproduce some parts for antiques he was refinishing. That led me down the path of furniture repair. I realized that it was working on smaller projects and using my woodworking skills that really was rewarding for me. After running my business with a mix of furniture repair and custom woodworking, I eventually decided to make the transition 100% to furniture repair in 2016. I've really enjoyed working on various projects. It's the problem solving I really enjoy about this. Figuring out what is the real problem that I'm looking to solve and how do I go about doing that. I feel myself fortunate that I've got the woodworking skills to be able to tackle a lot of these projects and that's why I share these projects on videos. I like to inspire people to look at what they can repair. If we can repair furniture and keep it from going to the landfill, I think that's a win. There's a number of quality pieces out there that could be fixed and I hope more and more people are empowered 
to be able to do that. I also find woodworking relaxing. Some people might think that's odd, but for me, this is where my heart and soul is. This is something that I'm passionate about, I love, and it's something I'll continue to do for years to come. After all that work, I've now got a functioning chair. I haven't glued this up yet because I need to put the finish on it first. I've got a scrap here that I'm going to try using a wire brush to mimic the texture that's in this and put the finish on and see how well I can match it. Here's the wire brush I'm going to use and on this block here, the grain is different on this side of the wood than it is on this side and you can see there's a knot, that's why I cut this off. So I want to try it on two different surfaces to see how this wire brushing technique works and I need to put on my respirator because I'm going to be generating a lot of dust. So if I hold this in the right light here, you can see there's a bit of texture there. When I flip it around to this side, there's not as much texture, so it might take a little more work to get the texture on that. I suspect here I'm able to get in between the green lines and wear some wood out. I'll bring this up here, see if I can catch it in the light. The green lines are a little more open than what I'm getting in this birch, but I think we'll put some finish on it and see how it's going to turn out. Before I use the wire brush on these, you can see how square this edge is. 
and these ones are rounded. So I rounded this inside one, and you can see here I've rounded the end as well to match. Here it's still square. I'll show you how I do that with a block plane and sandpaper. If you just use sandpaper to try to round this over, it'll take a long time. This is birch, and it's a hardwood. So with a block plane, just set slightly. What I do is just champ for the edge. And what that does is it starts taking off just the very edge of it. So now I've got a point that I can just sand it, round it over, and even it out. Just like that. I've wire brushed three sides here and I'm learning a technique here. If I push it down here and just move it forward, it's kind of smooth. So listen to this. But I find if I pitch it on a bit of an angle towards the direction I'm going, there's a bit of chattering. Listen to this. And that seems to be more effective in creating this wire brush marking. So if you want some texture, pitch it a little bit back. It'll make it much more effective as you're doing this. So the product I'm going to try here is a polyurethane that's got a lot of stain in it. And I haven't had good experience with this before because it gave me an inconsistent coverage. But on this, there are different areas that are lighter and darker, so I think I can use this to my advantage. Let's give it a try and see how this is going to work. See how dark that is? Now you can't get this from a regular finish, but because it's in the polyurethane, it really allows you to get a deep coverage of that finish. Hmm. I think the key here is going to be making sure it doesn't puddle because where it's puddling, I'm losing the grain. So I'm just going to take a little bit off. Leave it a little heavy in spots there. Let's see how that dries. I'll put the new leg in this side here and connect the stretcher. And then on this side here, I'll take the stretcher off, take the old leg out, and the leg that I have refinished goes in here. And now I can test fit these stretchers and trim them to fit. These new stretchers that I've made, there's a gap at the top and it's tight at the bottom. And on this other side here, I've got a gap at the bottom. So that's a pretty quick fix. I'll show you how to do that. I'll put my bench hook down here to hold the piece. And I'm going to be using a Dazuki saw. This is a very fine Japanese saw. Blade's very thin and it means I can cut very accurately. So with this part cut here, you can see I just need to connect this line over here and then I can go from here down to this point, clean it up with the chisel and we'll give it a test fit. So with a sharp chisel, I'll just clean out the inside here make sure there's nothing interfering to get a tight joint. And we'll give it a test fit. Perfect. I've got the stretchers all fit now and it's ready for glue up. Now typically when you assemble a chair like this you don't glue it together. This has been designed to put the tenon in here and then screw it together. 
The problem with that is on a chair where you've got constant movement, that metal wears out the wood and the joint becomes more loose over time and eventually the chair will fail. So having metal anywhere below the seat in a chair is not a good idea. I'll give you a close up here, I'll glue it up off camera, get it out of the way and then work on the other chair. This polyurethane finish is now dried enough, I can take a look at it, but it's not quite looking the way I hoped it would. You can see here I've got the darkness that I was looking for. This needs a little more black in it to match that color. But the thing that concerns me are the stripes here. So those ridges, the high points, aren't getting as much stain on them. So what's happening is the dark color is settling into the groups. So I need something that's more of a penetrating stain versus something that sits on the surface. Now stains can be a confusing topic, so let me just explain briefly. This is a finish with a stain in it, this is a polyurethane. There's also the option for a gel stain, and a gel stain can get things really dark, but unfortunately this is also sitting on the surface, so it's not going to solve the problem I've got here. The traditional stain that you buy in a hardware store is an oil-based stain, and it doesn't do all that well on penetrating light wood to give a dark look. I've just never been able to get it as dark as I need because you can only put one or two coats on and you can't put further on. Now, if you want to put more on, you can use something that's an acrylic stain, water-based, or something that is alcohol-based, this is a dye stain. So I'm going to use both of these on this test piece and see what gets me the right tone that I'm looking for so I can get the finish that I need. Now, I enjoy using acrylic stains because they're just easy water cleanup and they don't have any toxic smells. So I'll put some on here and see how this is going to dye everything the color that I need. So I would recommend using acrylic stains if you haven't used stains before, um, just to go through and, and get the colors without the toxicity. So you see how that's coming in? That's nice and consistent and I'm not getting those high points that I was uh, with the finish that sits on the surface. A dye stain needs to be mixed with alcohol. So I'm just putting a little bit in a plastic container here. And then I'll take the back of this old brush and put some in here. Don't think I need that much. And mix it up. So these two stains penetrate into the wood and it doesn't just sit on the surface. When you're dealing with a finish on the surface, if it scratches, you're going to see a light color underneath. But with something like this, it penetrates into the fibers of the wood. Okay, I've got nowhere near enough stain there. And when you're working with dye stains like this, you should really filter uh, the stain after you've mixed it because you can get little dots of pigment that don't fully dissolve in your finish. So it's a little fussier than working with the acrylic. Okay, so there you can see it's getting me some dark tone but it's going to take a few coats for that really to get dark. Now alcohol evaporates extremely quickly. So I can come back on here and put more on. Let it sit for a few minutes and then come back and do it again. I finished staining this and you can see it's a little bit lighter than what it was when it was wet. And that's typical. You need to go through the full finishing process to see the, the color is because the finish pulls the intensity out. The last thing I'm concerned about is the texture here. So you see how consistent the wire brush marks are here? And over here, there's almost gouges out of it. So I think I need to do a little bit more work on the texturing before I apply the stain here and the finish on top. I experimented here with a chisel, just a corner of the chisel, and then staining it again. And you can see here, I think it's too defined compared to what I've got in this leg. So the approach I'm going to use is use an awl to put some texture in. So through experimentation here, if I've got a raking light, I've got a light source right here, 
what it's doing is putting some shadows and it allows me to see where the brush marks are. And what I can do is just on a slight angle drag this in that mark and it's giving me the ability to get some texture a little deeper into those grooves without potentially looking like scratches across the piece. The last step is to put a top coat on top of the stain, but I need to let the stain dry first. In the meantime, let me tell you about purchasing furniture today. I'm reading this great book called Factory Man. It's about the Bassett Furniture Enterprise. And it goes back from the mid-1800s up to almost current day. And it talks about how the furniture industry has changed several times in North America through that time period. The most significant change has been the change of manufacturing in Asia. So by the early 2000s, about 50% of the wood furniture in North America was produced in Asia. If you're interested in the furniture industry, I'll leave a link to this book in the video description. Some people are now purchasing furniture online, something that was unthinkable back in 2003. Purchasing furniture online, like the box that I showed you and the chair that I repaired, are examples of how furniture comes to North America. It comes flat packed and it gets assembled afterwards. And because of that, the joinery in these pieces has changed of how chairs, for example, get put together. And a lot of what I'm seeing is something that's not going to last. It might be something you can have in your home for five to ten years, but it's certainly not going to last generations like some other pieces of furniture. So let me show you what you should be looking for when you're purchasing furniture if you'd like to keep it for the long term. Chairs are the most difficult pieces of furniture to build because they take so much punishment. You've got hundreds of pounds sitting on the chair and moving around. That constant movement eventually makes a chair loose. This chair is probably 80 to 100 years old and it needs to be re-glued. It's a simple process that I go through in my workshop and I show how to do that on my YouTube channel. A chair like this that uh, doesn't have any stretchers between the legs to stabilize the leg, this joint is going to wear out and eventually break. So this furniture is not going to last anywhere near as long as traditional furniture. The joinery here in this chair would be dowels on these joints, the same as what we're seeing here. We've got tenons, so the joinery is very similar, but in this particular case, because there's no stability, the leg's going to fail. Now, in the previous chair I showed you, the leg was bolted on, and I've got another chair here that's broken. I'll flip it over and we can take a look, and I'll show you the difference between a traditionally built chair and one that's built to assemble yourself. This is what the chair looks like right side up and the leg gets bolted on. I'll flip it over upside down and we'll see what the problem is. With the chair upside down, this is where this leg gets bolted on and this whole front has pulled off. So the reason that this chair failed is this corner block here broke. Now this is a common table construction technique. We've got two aprons, a corner block, and you bolt a table leg on. And that's fine for a table because the table is fairly stable. It doesn't take a lot of abuse. But in a chair where there's constant movement, this is not a good construction technique. Bolting this on, the only thing that's holding it on is this pressure point. So when this board failed, obviously it's come apart. Someone tried to fix it with some polyurethane glue. So I wouldn't recommend buying chairs that have bolts through legs like this. I can also tell by looking at the wood grain here, this is not a quality piece of furniture. A defect like this should never be in a chair leg because you need the strength. Wherever you've got a knot, it's a point of weakness. I've got another example I'll show you about that. 
This is a broken piece the customer decided to throw away, so I've hung on to it as an example. So you can see right here, we've got a knot. And wood grain has strength in the long fibers. It's like a bunch of straws oriented this way. But as soon as that grain changes, either on an angle or around a knot, there's no strength to it. So this leg just broke right off. Now, you never know that that was an issue because it was stained so dark. So when you've got very dark stain, in some cases painted, it's something that's disguising the wood, so you can't actually see the quality of furniture that you're getting. My recommendation in purchasing chairs are three things. One is don't buy legs that are bolted on. The second one is make sure you've got stretchers between the legs because it's critical for the stability of the chair and making sure those joints are going to last a long time. And the third one is making sure that you can see the grain, that there are no defects in the wood and you've got long straight grain that's going to give you the strength. Purchasing pre-assembled chairs is something that's more expensive than flat pack chairs. But like the old saying goes, you get what you pay for, it's very true for chairs. Now, if affordability is an issue for you, you can purchase used furniture. A chair like this, for example, might sell for $20. I've coached both my children through buying solid wood tables and four chairs, and they've got those for $100. So the used furniture market is very affordable out there. Now, I think the stain is dried. Acrylic stains dry pretty quick. Let's take a look at this before I put the finish on. I like the texture that I'm getting through here. It's very similar. Now the color is a little bit lighter than what I've got here, but once I put the clear coat on, it should darken it down, and I'll see if I have to do any further tinting. The finish I'm going to use here is Garnet Shellac. I mix this up from Shellac Flakes. Just wipe some of that on here. Now the great thing about shellac is it's wonderful for small shops, non-toxic, and it dries extremely quickly. So the downfall of it is it's not a finish that can hold up to alcoholic drinks, for example, but on a leg like this, it's absolutely perfect for putting on a quick finish and providing a film finish to protect the leg. I've tested a few finishes here, and this is the shellac that I'm wiping on, but it's actually taking off some of the stain, so that's not going to work. I've sprayed on some shellac here, so that's an option, but it's coming out flat. It's going to take some buildup. This is lacquer here in the corner. You can see there's just a bit of a line there, and that's working, but uh, lacquer is fairly toxic, not something I enjoy using in my shop. And then here, this is the polyurethane, and you can see I'm getting the darkness that I need to match the finish, a bit of a sheen, so that's what I'm going to go with. The finish is now dried on this, and I'm happy with how it's turned out. The last step in finishing is to rub the finish, and you don't want to use sandpaper on this. What I do is use a paper bag, and it's just abrasive enough to smooth out any little nibs that might be standing up. I need to take off the tape here, glue this together, and then I can put the upholstery back on. So we'll just prop this back out again. It'll make it easier to assemble. I'll protect the fabric so I don't get any glue on it. And I apply glue to both the tenon and the mortise. So this is the tenon here. And you don't need anything on the ends because the ends don't actually touch anything. It's just the sides here. Now there isn't much strength in putting glue on this part here, but I'll add it anyway. Any little bit's going to help with this joint. Okay, now we can put it together.
So there you have it, the repaired chair. I'm really happy with how the color turned out. The key to doing this is making sure you're using samples to get through the full finishing process so you can understand what you're going to get. I'll put this up here and you can take a closer look at the finish. Now you can understand that new furniture requires new repair techniques, and I hope some of these techniques will help you in your furniture repairs. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you haven't subscribed to our channel, click over here, click on that bell icon, and get notified every time we publish a video. Thanks for watching Fixing Furniture. <music>